Elihu, Job's fourth friend, speaks up. He is angry, both at Job, because he justified himself rather than God, and at Job's three friends, because they found no answer for Job and therefore condemned God. Let's open up the Bible and think on these things. This is the Word of Truth Ministry Video Library. I am Nathan C. Johnson, Bible Teacher. I greet you in the faith and fellowship of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose we are, whom we love, and whom we serve. Let's open our Bibles and turn today to Job chapter 32. Now we had just finished reading about the Job's three friends, and how they argued against Job that he must have done something to deserve the calamity that happened to him. And yet Job completely and thoroughly demolished their arguments in the last few chapters. But now we get, in Job chapter 32, to Elihu, the fourth friend. So Job chapter 3 and verse 1, So these three men ceased to answer Job, because he was righteous in his own eyes. So these three men, and that's the Hebrew Enosh, meaning mortal fallen men, and they acted like it. <laughs> because they realized that Job would not admit to any wrongdoing. They insisted, Job, you must have done wrong that made you deserve all this that happened to you. And he insisted that he hadn't. And, so they, and they had utterly failed to prove that he had done anything wrong. So they fell silent. Verse 2, Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled, because he justified himself rather than God. So here we realize that, that this whole time, during this whole argument, this whole discussion, it's not just been like there's Job and his three friends, and they're all alone, they're in some deserted place. Job is sitting out on this ash heap all by himself, and, and they're there, and there's no one else there. No. No, there are lots of other people there. We would suspect Job was one of the most powerful people in the area. And these three men were also powerful. When they came to visit Job, they probably bought, brought huge, a huge entourage of servants and attendants with them. And the people of the town, they're probably all sitting around listening. There's probably a huge crowd. This is like the entertainment of the day. They're all listening to Job and his three friends discuss. So it's not just Job and his three friends all by themselves. And one of this crowd that's listening is named Elihu. Now that comes from El, which means God, the mighty God. And Elihu means, my God is he. He is my God. Barachel means, whom God has blessed. That's his father. And Booz was probably a descendant of Nahor, the brother of Abraham. As we've seen, we can't tell for sure who Job and these men were, but it seems... Rather likely that some of them are descendants of, of Abraham. And this one, if he's indeed a Buzite, who is descendant of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Well, he'd be related to Abraham. Ram means high or exalted. And it's probably the same as Aram, who is Booz's nephew. So we read that this Elihu is angry at what he's heard. He's angry, we read, first of all, at Job. Why? Well, because he justified himself. The Hebrew, that is, nephesh. He justified his own soul, himself, rather than God. He says, everyone should always speak first and foremost for God. And yet Job justified himself at the expense of God, so he's angry. And yet he's not just angry at Job. Verse 3, also against his three friends was his wrath kindled, because they had found no answer, and yet had condemned Job. So he was also wrathful against Job's three friends. He's not just angry at Job. He's angry at Job's three friends as well. Why is he angry at the three friends? Well, it says because they found no answer for Job's arguments, justifying himself rather than God. And therefore, they condemned Job. But the problem is this is not what the Hebrew text originally said. There's a group of 
self-appointed editors of scripture called the Sophrim. Sophos meaning wise. So they called themselves the wise ones, the knowing ones. And they edited the scriptures. Now the original text read, read, they found no answer and yet had condemned God. And there should be no yet. They found no answer and had condemned God. And the Sophrim, from their own motives of false reverence for God, changed it from God to Job. And yet messing up the Bible and thinking that you respect God more than he does, that is not good. And the Sophrim did, did very bad work when they lifted up their pens against the word of God the way they did. Yes, because they insisted that God did this to you, Job, and so he must have, you must have done something to deserve it. Well, then when Job proved he didn't do anything to deserve it, well, therefore, their arguments condemned God because God had punished someone who didn't deserve it. So he is angry at them for daring to argue this way and therefore condemning God through their failure to prove Job's fault. Verse 4. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And elder means old of years. These, these men were older of years than Elihu was. So he figured, well, it, it wouldn't be right to interrupt them. And these older men, well, they should probably have some answer for Job, even if I don't. And so he waited for them to come up with an answer for Job, but they never did. Of course, that was per their culture. He always respected the elders, and that's appropriate. It's probably bad in our culture that we don't respect elders. Then verse 5, when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. So Elihu is angry at the ignorance and failure of Job's three friends. So verse 6, And Elihu the son of Barachel the Buzzite answered and said, and from here on we'll be reading from the metrical version of Dr. E.W. Bullinger. He said, I am but young in years, and ye are old. Therefore it was that I held back in fear, and durst not show what my opinion was. So he says, I, I'm young. And the Hebrew could also mean, I'm insignificant in years. My years are not as significant as yours. And so he says, this explains why I held back in fear and proper reverence and respect and, and didn't show my opinion until now because of my, my youth relative to you. Verse 7, for those of many days should speak, I thought, a multitude of years should wisdom teach. So he says that I assumed wisdom would come with years. And since you're older than I am, that you would speak wisdom better than I could. Well, this is not always so. Those older in years aren't always wise if they don't really know and understand the works and ways of God. Verse 8, However, a spirit dwells in mortal man, and Shaddai's breath makes them to understand. He says there, a spirit dwells in man, and that is the Hebrew word ruach, the Hebrew word for spirit. And he says a spirit, by the way, that word is also used to the Holy Spirit. But he says a spirit dwells in mortal man. That is again, enosh, mortal man. And Shaddai's breath makes them to understand. Now the King James says, an inspiration of the Almighty. An inspiration there, and what Bollinger has translated breath, is neshama. And that is the word for breath. And back in Genesis, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, that was neshama, the breath, which first gave life to Adam. And, and breath is often connected, by the way, neshama and ruach are often connected, spirit and breath. And then he says Shaddai, King James made it almighty, Hebrew is Shaddai, which means the venerable God, the God who's worthy of being worshipped and respected and reverenced. He says that his breath makes them to understand. Verse 9, the greatest men are not at all times wise, nor do the aged always rightly judge. And this is certainly true. That the great, the high and mighty, the rulers and the rich and powerful are not always the wisest. Sometimes the poor and impoverished can be wiser. 
and neither are the old always right at their judgment. No. No, you don't necessarily learn judgment the older you get. Sometimes you don't. Verse 10, Therefore I said, O hearken unto me, I too will show my knowledge, even I. So he says, Therefore I decided to speak up and say, Listen to me, even though I'm younger than you, listen to me, and I'll show you what I know. Verse 11, Lo, I have listened unto your discourse, to all your reasonings have I given ear, waiting till you have searched out what to say. So he says, I've heard all that's been said. I haven't missed any of it. I've been listening this whole time to your discussion. And he says, I, I've been waiting to hear some wisdom from you. I've been waiting to hear you come up with some wise things. Now notice he says, waiting till you have searched out what to say. And this implies that there have been pauses between addresses. Now we talk about the fact that in Hebrew, everything they say is in poetry. And we ask, did they really speak in poetry on the fly? Well, he speaks out here of, of them searching out what to say. So probably they had to sit there thinking how to put their answer in verse before they could answer. So there probably were pauses between the discourses. Other than that last one where I showed you so far, interrupted Job. And then Job just went right back to his discourse and ignored Zophar. But for the most part, they've been pausing and, and composing what they say. And that makes sense since they're speaking in verse. I mean, you can't just speak in verse the kind of things they've been saying off the top of your head. So he says, I've, I've listened to everything you've said. I've waited. Well, the next one would work out what he was going to say and then said it. I've listened the whole time. Verse 12, But though to you I carefully gave heed, there was not one of you convicted Job, not one who really answered what he said. So he condemns these three friends. He says, I listened to you, and none of you convicted Job of any wrong. He said, you, you insisted he must have done wrong, and yet none of you pointed out what that was. And you insisted that his words weren't right, but, but never really answered his words. Not one of you convicted Job, not one of you really answered what he said. Verse 13, I pray you, say not, we have wisdom found. Tis God alone who thrusts him down, not man. He says, stop saying you're wise by insisting that El, he says, El, the mighty God, insisting that you're wise by saying, it's the mighty God who's thrust you down and not man. And, and this means we're wise to say this. He says, don't say that anymore. <laughs> well, that was, that was very true. They shouldn't have been saying that. Verse 14, since not against me hath he arrayed his words, I will not with your words reply to him. So he says, Job didn't make his answers to me, so I'm not going to reply to his answers. I'm not going to try to answer Job. He was speaking to you and your pathetic arguments, I'm not going to try to answer him, I'm just going to make my own argument, he says. Verse 15, All broken down, they answer him no more. They have not any more a word to say. So he points out the obvious fact, Job has demolished your arguments. Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far, he's demolished your arguments. You've had, you've had nothing to say. He has totally and thoroughly, by his conclusion especially, just ripped them apart. And so they were just they were just demolished. They had no more argument to make. Job's final discourse was sweeting, sweeping and irrefutable. And it just shut them up completely. Verse 16, And still I waited, though they could not speak. But silence stood and offered no reply. So he said, I waited to let you answer, to see if you could come up with something. Probably Eliphaz must have been the next one to give another address, but he had nothing. He had just given up, and Bildad, as hypocrisy has been pointed out, and so far has got so mad his rude interruption, but, but his saying was just a lot of platitudes. And they had nothing more to say, and Elihu and everyone could see it. So he said, I waited for you to have an answer. Maybe this time you'll come up with something actually wise, but nothing. 
Nothing. You didn't answer. You couldn't answer. Verse 17, I will reply, even I, on mine own part, I too will show my knowledge, even I. So he says, now I'm determined that I'm going to speak up and answer Job. And not answering his arguments to the three friends, but answering, as we see his whole attitude, that he is justifying himself rather than God in what has taken place. He says, I'm, he's going to answer that. And he says, I'm going to show that I know something. Verse 18, for I am filled full with wisdom's words. The spirit in my breast constraineth me. So he claims to have the wisdom that these three friends lacked, the wisdom to answer Job. And he says that the, the, the spirit within him, and that is ruach again, the, the spirit connected with the breath, but the, the mind, the spirit is also connected with the mind, the thoughts. He says, the spirit in me, And it says, within the belly, or Bollinger says, within my breast, the spirit in my breast, the intelligence in my breast, he says, constrains me. Verse 19, it is as wine secured without a vent, like wineskins new, which are at point to burst. So he says, my, my breast and, and the thoughts in my breast, he says, they're like a skin bottle with no vent. And this was when they were they were fermenting wine in a skin bottle, and as the wine would ferment, the bottle would swell. And he says, like, like no vent in a skin bottle full of wine, why it's in danger of bursting. If it swells up enough, it will burst. He says, so my breast is like that. I'm, I'm swelling up with my answer, and I'll burst if I don't say it. And he says, my belly... And that is just the, the same word as, as my breast in verse 18. Wine here is yayin, and yayin is the, the Hebrew generic word for grape juice or wine or really any alcohol is a very generic word. So he says, it, my breast is just like wine skins about to burst. They've swelled so much. Verse 20. So I will speak that I may find relief. Open my lips and take up my discourse. So he says, I'm going to, to speak up so I can find relief from the pressure. <laughs> this pressure that's building up in me, I have to speak to relieve it. Verse 21, I will not now regard the face of man, and to no man will flattering titles give. He says, up till now I favored you because you're older than I am, but from now on I'm not going to favor anyone. I'm not going to favor Job, I'm not going to favor his three friends, I'm not going to favor the older or more powerful or anyone. Any man, Hebrew ish, it means man, but it could be generic for any person. And I will not regard the face of, of man, the, the presence of, of anyone, that what his presence seems to give off, his reputation. King James translated person, but, it, but it's really the face, the face of any man, any man's presence. And I'll give no man... No member of Adam's race, this time it's Adam, not Ish. I'll give no member of Adam's race flattering titles. Oh, you great and high one, I need to favor you because you're so great and high. No, I'm not going to do that, he says. Verse 22, I know not how to flatter. Otherwise, my maker soon would summon me away. Now, of course, this is probably oriental hyperbole. I don't even know how to flatter. Well, of course, he knew how to flatter, but he means he's, he's not going to flatter. He's going to say things like they are. Well, let's hope that Elihu can live up to his proud claims. So now we come to chapter 33, and Elihu, the fourth friend, makes his first address to Job. And we'll see he argues that Job needs God's righteousness. Chapter 33 and verse 1. And now, O Job, I pray thee, hear me speak, and be attentive to my every word. So he addresses Job first and calls on him to listen to every word, he says. What I say is going to be wise, it's going to be helpful to you, so listen carefully. Verse 2, Behold, now that I have begun to speak, my tongue shall utterance give, distinct and clear. So he says, now that I am speaking, I'm going to speak and speak clearly. I'm not going to hold anything back. Just watch and, and see that I don't. Verse 3, For all that I shall say comes from my heart. My lips shall speak what is sincere and true. 
No, what I say comes from my heart. Now, when we say this, this comes from my heart. Of course, we speak of the heart as the seat of emotions. It comes from my emotional center. This is, this is how I feel about things. These are my real feelings on the matter, we mean when we say this comes from my heart. But the Hebrew is not so. The heart was the inner being, and it was the source especially of the motivations. The motivations. Now I believe when Elihu says this comes from my heart, he says, this comes from honest and sincere motivations. In other words, the things I say are what I sincerely believe. I'm not dissembling. I'm not using subterfuge. I'm not saying these things just to look good in front of this crowd or anything like that. No, I'm saying these things because this is sincerely what I believe. That's what Elihu insists. I speak what's sincere and true, what, what I really think. Verse 4, God's Spirit made me at the first, and still tis the Almighty's breath must quicken me. So he says, the Spirit of El, El, the mighty God, powerful God, his Spirit, that's Ruach again, but this time Ruach means, of course, God's Spirit, and not Elihu's. God's Spirit made me at the first, and still tis the Almighty's, tis Shaddai's, the venerable God, the God who is worthy of reverence and worship, it is his breath, Neshamach, often associated with Ruach. He says, it's his breath that, that must quicken me, that must keep me alive. And it does. If we ever stop breathing, we die. If we lose that breath we got from God. Verse 5, if thou be able, answer me, I pray. Array thy words in order. Take thy stand. So he says to Job, are, are you able, are you ready to answer? We'll see if you can answer me. You've answered your three friends thoroughly and completely. Let's see if you can answer me. So he says, if you're able, answer bef now before my face. It says again in Hebrew, panim, face. Answer in my presence. And take your stand on what your answer is, if you have an answer. He doesn't think Job will have an answer to him, like he had to his friends. Verse 6, lo, I am here. Thou wishest in God's stead, and of the clay I have been formed like thee. Now remember, Job had said, oh, if only there was some mediator, some go-between who could lay his hand on God and on me and be a go-between for us, because I, I can't answer God, I can speak to him. I just I just wish there was some mediator to lay his hand on us both. And Elihu who said, like, like you wanted, I'm the mediator. Listen to me now. <laughs> Either he's speaking the truth, and he is, which means that he is the best of these five men, or else he's lying, which means he's worse even than Job's three friends. <laughs> but he's claiming to be the mediator Job asked for. And let's see if his words prove that true. So he says, I've been formed of clay like you. I'm not God who isn't formed of clay. And so I'm the mediator. I, I too am a created being, so I can be a mediator and, and have sympathy on you. You think God can't, because he's not a created being like you. Verse 7, Behold, my terror will not make thee fear, nor heavy will my hand upon thee press. So he says, I'm not going to be terrifying you as you've been terrified. Now, Job, remember, blamed God for terrifying him. But we know from the beginning of the book that it was really Satan that was terrifying Job. He's trying to turn Job against God with all his evil satanic force. And every wicked blow of Satan, Job has assumed is God's blow against him. But he says, I'm not going to terrify you like, like he thought God was terrifying him. Nor is my hand going to hand press heavy upon you like like Satan's hand has pr had pressed heavy upon him, and he thought it was God's. Verse 8, But surely thou hast spoken in mine ears, and I have heard a voice of words like these. So he says, Though I'm not going to terrify you, though my hand isn't going to be heavy upon you, yet I, I've heard your argument. I've heard you say things like this, and he's going to repeat the kind of things he's heard Job say. Verse 9, A man without transgression, pure am I. Yea, I am clean without iniquity. So he says, Job, I've heard you claim to be pure, to be a clean man without, without iniquity at all. And yes, that is what Job had claimed. In his zeal to insist that he'd done nothing to deserve the calamities that came on him, he had claimed to be pure and clean like the wind-driven snow. Well, if that was really the case, if Job really was a sinless, perfect individual, why, that would go against Scripture's claim that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
Job somehow would have escaped the corruption of sin that came upon Adam's race. And so Job's claim really went too far. In trying to insist he didn't do anything to deserve this, he had claimed perfect moral purity. And Elihu points this out, that this, this can't possibly be true. Verse 10, He is against me, seeking grounds of strife, that he may count me as his enemy. So Elihu says that he has also heard Job say that God has been seeking grounds for a quarrel with Job, for strife with him. That God has wanted to count Job as an enemy even though he had no cause to do so. He says, I've, I've heard you accuse God this way, Job. Verse 11, My feet he setteth fast within the stocks and taketh observation of my ways. So he claims that God has humiliated him. Of course, putting someone in the stocks was to publicly humiliate that person. So he claims God has humiliated me and is just looking for things to accuse me of since he's decided to be my enemy. Well, that certainly is what Job had said about God. And we have to admit Job had been greatly provoked, not only by the horrible things that had happened to him, but by his three friends and their unfair accusations. But still, this is what Job had said. And so Elu is right. He, he said, I'm not going to put too heavy a hand on you, but I have heard you say these things. And he had. Verse 12, Behold, thou art not just, I answer thee. How great is God compared with mortal man? So he insists that Job's argument is not right. It's not righteous. It's not just. So he says, I'm going to answer what you said. He says, how great is God? And that is Eloah, the venerable God, the God who is worthy of respect. How great is he compared to Enosh, mortal man, corrupt and subject to death? And Boldra says, this is the theme of Elihu's argument. The greatness of God and the inferiority of mortal man. He says, God is great. God is greater than we are. And this is the thrust of my argument. Verse 13, Why then against him didst thou dare make complaint, that by no word of his he answereth thee? So he says, Considering how much greater God is than fallen man, how did you, a fallen man, Job, dare to complain against him and say, He's being unfair and not answering my accusations? He says, how did you dare to do such a thing, considering how much greater he is than you are? And Job himself, it, himself admits he'd done this, and it wasn't right, later when God shows up and answers him. Verse 14, for God does speak. He speaks in sundry ways, again, again, though man regard it not. So he says, you've claimed that God has kept silent, but God, El here, the mighty God, the mighty God does speak, he doesn't keep silent. And that's true, God doesn't keep silent. And even today, when we have no direct word from God, we call this the time of God's silence, we realize that God still speaks through his word. Even today, God is only directly silent. He still does speak through the Bible he wrote. Of course, in Job's day, there wasn't really a Bible, maybe a few chapters written of Genesis, but not really a Bible for him to speak through, but he did speak directly. And God is never completely silent. Today, he speaks through his word. So he says, God doesn't keep silent, and back in that day, he didn't keep silent and tie himself down to the word. Now we'll see that Elihu is correct, for God, indeed, will speak up later. But he says, God speaks in many ways, in different ways. You just want him to come and speak to you directly, but he speaks many ways. And the many ways, the Hebrew seems to say, once, twice, meaning in different ways. Again, again, Bollinger translated it, though man regard it not. Verse 15, he speaks in dreams and visions of the night, when deep in slumber, lying on their bed, there falls on men an overwhelming sleep. So he says he often speaks in dreams and visions. Now he did back then. Now dispensationally, we live today in the dispensation of grace, when God has said all that he wants to say in his word, and so he is silent except for what he says in the Bible. But back before the completion of the Bible and before this dispensation of grace and God's silence came, God would speak at times in dreams and visions. And we see this happen in the book of Genesis, especially as the background to Job, 
We believe that Job took place around the time of, of the ending portion of the book of Genesis, or early Exodus. And we see over and over in Genesis, God speaks through dreams. He spoke to Pharaoh, remember, through dreams that Joseph interpreted. To Pharaoh's servants, he spoke in dreams which Joseph interpreted. Even before then, he spoke to Abimelech through a dream, warning him that he'd taken Sarah, thinking she was Abraham's unmarried sister, and really she was his wife. So he spoke to people in dreams. Now, this doesn't happen today, but he did it back then. In dreams and visions of the night, these were visions, not just pillow pictures like our dreams, but visions from God. When deep in slumber, lying on their bed, there falls on men an overwhelming sleep. And then God gives them these dreams. Verse 16, Then opens he their ear that they may hear, pressing as with a seal the warning given. So he opens men's ear, that's mortal men again, in Osh. He opens their ear to hear his sayings. And he presses upon them the warning like, like men press a seal on a document. Verse 17, to make a man withdraw himself from sin or keep him from the dangerous way of pride. So he says to make a man, this time it's an Adam, make a member of Adam's race, could be man or woman of course, withdraw himself from sin. He gives this warning in the dream. Or to keep him from the dangerous way of pride, to keep a mortal man and the second time the man there is Geber, the, the strong man, to keep a strong man from pride. Now we'll see later that this is God's argument to Job, basically. It is that God is the one who can humble the proud, and Job has been proud in his claims that I could argue with God and prove him wrong, prove that I never did anything to deserve this. He's been proud, and Job admits it. Verse 18, back from the pit, tis thus he keeps a man, and saves his life from falling by the sword. So he says, by warning people, he keeps them back from the pit. Now, pit there is a word that, that means a dugout grave. Shachath is the Hebrew word, which is that, that dugout grave, dug out of the earth. Back from the pit, tis thus he keeps a man. In Hebrew, that's actually nephesh, the word for soul. He keeps his soul from the pit and saves his life from falling by the sword. So soul there is nephesh, the usual word for soul. Life is he, the usual word for life. And throughout this portion, Elihu uses the two as synonyms, life and soul. So he keeps his soul from the pit, saves his life from falling by the sword through communicating with them in this way. Verse 19, he speaks again when, chastened on his bed, another lies, his bones all racked with pain. So he says, God speaks again to one who is, is chastened by him by illness. Lying on his bed, racked with pain, he speaks to him. Verse 20, so that his daily food he doth abhor and turns against his choicest dainty meat. So he's so sick he can't eat, is what he means. And in the Hebrew there, his life abhors bread and his soul abhors his choicest meat. And again, we have chay and nefesh, life and soul, used together there. Verse 21, his flesh it wastes away and is not seen. His bones before concealed show through his skin. So the illness wastes away his flesh, he says, till you can see his bones through his skin. Now this is probably not a bad description of Job. He says, Job, God is going to speak to you to save you from the proud course you're on. And God did, he was right. Verse 22, unto destruction he is drawing nigh, and death's dark angel waits to end his life. So the Hebrews, his soul draws near to destruction, nephesh, and death's dark angel waits to end his life, that's hey again. And destruction there, Bulger translates it destruction, it's the same word as that, that dug out grave, pit, in verse 18. So these three words used together again by Elihu. So he's, he's ready to die. Verse 23, Then, then he speaks with him by messenger, who can interpret, one among thousands chief, who will reveal to man his righteousness. So he says, then as his soul and his life are about to come to an end, he says, then God will speak to him by a messenger. 
And that's the Hebrew word malach, which is the word that's often translated angel. He'll speak to him as an angel. Of course, in the Bible, angels could be supernatural or human messengers from God. This angel can interpret to him basically what's happening. Chief among thousands who will reveal to man his righteousness. Who his own righteousness? No, he'll reveal to Adam God's righteousness. Verse 24, Then he doth show him grace divine, and saith, Deliver him from going down to death. A ransom I have found, redemption's price. So he says that this messenger will show him grace divine from God and will explain to him how he can be delivered from going down to the, the dugout grave, the pit, because he will have found a ransom. Now ransom there is actually the Hebrew word for atonement, kofera, covering over. And this is always done in the Bible by the shedding of blood. The price of expiation. He'll show him how to get a ransom for his sin. Now this is very similar to the gospel we proclaim today. Which is that we were sinners subject to death. And yet the messenger that comes to us, the gospel, shows us that there's a ransom through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for our sins, and when we believe in him, we'll receive the imputed righteousness he offers. So a very good message. Elihu has here, very similar to our gospel. Verse 25, Young as a child's becomes his flesh again, into his youthful days he doth return. So then, when, when the ransom is found, when his sin is covered, he, his flesh, that was so wasting away, becomes like a child's again, and he returns to his youth. This will indeed happen to Job, as we'll see. Verse 26, He supplication to Eloah makes, who grace and kindly favor showeth him, so that he looketh up to God with joy. Thus doth he give to man his righteousness. So he makes supplication to Eloah, the venerable God, worthy of respect and worship, who showed him such grace and favor. He looks up to God with joy, or with shouts of joy. And he says, Thus he gives to man, to an osh, mortal man, his righteousness. So he says the solution is to receive God's righteousness. Now, does this seem strange to you to find such a message in an Old Testament book like Job? But remember, even in Genesis, we read that God credited Abraham's faith to him for righteousness. So it shouldn't surprise us to find a message like this in, in Job, one of the earliest books in the Bible, probably the earliest one finished, maybe even before Genesis. God gives man his righteousness by imputation, not his own righteousness. Verse 27, this then becomes the burden of his song. I sinned and I perverted what was right, although no profit from it came to me. So he says, this then becomes the burden of his song. Now he looks upon men, mortal men is, the Hebrew says, enosh. He looks on men and, and he says this, what does he say? I sinned and perverted what was right. Bullinger says this is true wisdom. To one who has received God's righteousness, he realized, I'm, I'm a sinner. I needed God's righteousness. I did what was wrong, even though no prophet came to me. And Bullinger says this is true wisdom and the end of the Lord James spoke of. Remember we saw in James 5.11 that you have heard of the patience of Job and, and have read of the end of the Lord. In James 5.11, that the Lord is very pitiful, very gracious, and of tender mercy. Sure enough, that's what he says here. He's gracious and merciful to the sinner. And even Job reached this conclusion in Job 42, verses 2 through 5. When he said, I poured myself repent in dust and ashes, he says, I see my own sinful condition. So he says, I sinned even though it brought me no profit. Verse 28, his soul he hath redeemed from the pit. His life will yet again behold the light. So pit, again, is his dugout grave. He redeems his soul, his nephesh, from the pit, his life, his chay. Again, all these words used together. His life will, again, behold the light. Why? Because God has rescued him. And he comes back to the light from the darkness he was in. Verse 29, Thus doth God speak in all these sundry ways, time after time, and yet again he speaks. So he says, God, El, the mighty God, speaks like this, time after time after time. 
And he works this way with Geber, with, with every strong man. And indeed, God does this today. He shows men their sinful condition. He shows them the ransom in Jesus Christ. He does that again and again and again in our day. Every time someone is saved, it's because God shows him these truths. Verse 30, that from destruction he may save a soul and make him joy and light, the light of life. So he says he does this, that he might save a soul from that dugout pit, soul nephesh, make him joy in the light of life, chay again. Verse 31, Mark this, O Job, and hearken unto me. I will now speak, and as for thee, hold thou thy peace, while I with words of wisdom teach. So he says to Job, listen to this carefully, listen to what I'm saying. In other words, this idea that he shouldn't be arguing his own righteousness because what he needs is God's righteousness. He shouldn't trust in what he has done. He should seek redemption from God as a sinner. He should seek atonement. He should seek the covering over of his sins and not argue for his own righteousness, his own merit. Verse 32, If there be any answer, answer me. Speak, for I long to see thee justified. He says, Job, if you have any answer, give it. He says, what I really want is to see your justification. But my claim is your justification isn't going to be through arguing your own righteousness and God's unfairness, but it'll be through accepting God's ransom, his righteousness and justification. That's how you'll be justified, Job. Verse 33, if not, do thou then hearken unto me. Hold thou thy peace, while wisdom I impart. So he says, Job, if you have no answer, then just listen. I've got more to say. Hold your peace, be quiet, I'll impart more wisdom. Well, he did say a lot of great things here, didn't he? Elihu was younger than Job and his three friends, and he kept quiet till now. However, his wrath was roused against Job for justifying himself rather than God, and against his three friends who insisted there must be a reason God did this to Job, and then when they, they couldn't find a reason, condemned God. So he insists, even though I'm young, God can give me wisdom as well, and I'm going to speak. And I'm going to start out speaking to you, Job. You claim to be pure and without transgression. That God had, has humiliated you unfairly. But no, God is, is greater than you. He's too great to do such a thing. God speaks in many ways, dreams and visions, calling men to turn from their sin to himself. Sometimes he chastens men with illness. So when the messenger comes to them, proclaiming to them that God has a ransom for them, that they'll listen. And if they'll listen and accept the ransom he gives, well, then he'll give them his righteousness and restore them. Now, this is the very thing we find in our Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith in him results in righteousness imputed to us. And praise God, we can receive his righteousness. Well, we'll close the book at this point. If you've enjoyed these things I've, I've taught, please press like below. Comment if you have any comments. And until we meet again around the pages of God's book, I bid you goodbye.